people and diverse design community in Boston. And my commitment to that goal has only strengthened in the last 18 months to create a Boston that really works for everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic and cries for racial justice last year confirm what we already knew, that low-income communities of color are disproportionately burdened by poor health, economic and environmental outcomes, and concurrently very seldom experience the benefits that come from planning and development. The BSA is a membership organization working to support over 4,500 professionals that work to shape our city's built environment every day to improve the quality of life for everyone. Over the next decade and into the future, our vision for the BSA is to be a leader in the development and application of design solutions to the climate equity and justice crisis in the built environment and help to empower transformative solutions to our region's most vex vexing problems, working with architects, designers, developers, and other building professionals. In Greater Boston, like many other communities, the realities of disparate economic gaps, inequitable education opportunities, unequal access to housing and work, unsafe and unjust conditions, and vulnerability to climate change has all contributed to um, things that you know, are creating systemic inequity and we have to forge a pathway to a more just and equitable future. Architecture, urban planning and the larger building community play an integral role in shaping our city and must play a leading role in the change required to bring real solutions forward to really influence the way our city is designed and built for equity. As such, this forum is an important opportunity for our members and the general public to hear from each candidate on how they plan to address all these pressing issues and to learn how they will address issues around equity, climate resiliency, net zero buildings, affordable housing, and the development process in Boston, along with other aspects of the Boston's built environment and how at that impact how we live and work as a city. I will now turn it over to Liz, who will start the discussion today. Thanks very much, Greg. So hello and full disclosure, I am not a Boston resident. I live in Cambridge and prior to moving here, I lived and worked in several global cities, Mumbai, Singapore, and Shanghai, where it was fascinating to see how those vastly different cities tackle or don't the huge issues that we're gonna be talking about. And as this audience likely knows, in Singapore, the Big Dig would have been done in a year and Storo Drive would have been buried to create parkland, so no more Storo trucks. But one thing all those cities have in common with the city of Boston is they are all extremely vulnerable to climate change, which brings me back to our topics today, climate resiliency, net zero buildings, affordable housing, and the development process in Boston, along with other aspects of Boston's built environment. Everyone here, is well known to our audience, so I'm not going to make formal introductions. Here's the blueprint for this event. I'm going to ask some questions, take some audience questions, and then we have a question from the candidates for the other candidates. So candidates, please be as specific as possible in your answers, but please keep your answers as short as possible. Uh, for most questions, you're going to have under two minutes to answer, and we're going to let you know if you need to wrap it up, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So a bit of housekeeping before we begin. By now, you've probably attended a few virtual events, maybe a few dozen. But just in case it's your first, audience members, your microphones are muted. Your video is turned off. And we cannot take your comments in the chat box. However, we will share relevant information with you there. I have many questions from audience members that were sent in early. So we. We do have a lot, but the producers are monitoring the Q&A box and you can open it at the bottom of your screen. So if you have a, a real zinger during this event, you put that question there. So let's go to our first question. This is for all the candidates who are here. Acting Mayor Janey, she seems to have thrown down the gauntlet uh, when she moved to scrap the downtown waterfront district municipal harbor plan. Um, what's your reaction to that? And would you take steps like that for other waterfront developments that arise or any other project you want to 
draw a red line on. John Barris, let's start with you. Liz, thank you very much. Good afternoon to you. And I want to thank all of those uh, who are able to uh, come together and organize this forum for us and thank the BSA for your leadership. Uh, when it comes to the Municipal Harbor Plan, um, you know, I think the central issue, the, the controversial issue, were the developments on the waterfront. And clearly the 600,000 600, square feet, um, 600 square feet, excuse me, building on the waterfront uh, was problematic. Um, did it need to, do we need to pull the entire Harbor Plan? Probably not, but that's what drove it. Um, now we need to go back and look at some of the, the amazing comments and inputs that people gave during that process with over 40 uh, community meetings, talking about the activation of open space on the waterfront, the importance of activating the water sheet on the, on the waterfront, the importance of climate resilience and all of the different efforts uh, that people specified in that plan that we need to protect. We need to move on that. We need to build on the input of the public uh, and the plan uh, to move it forward while addressing, and I've said very publicly, while addressing the Harbor Garage. We do not need a 600 foot, 600 feet uh, building, uh, but we do need to address that, that, that parcel. I think the Harbor Garage, and I think most people will agree is not the right use on that site. And I've said, said publicly that I would work with Don Shafaro to uh, help him build his tower in a more appropriate location so that we can, in fact, take down that garage, bring down the parking to underground because we do need that parking, build a facility that's modest and that has an architectural uh, public statement for that site. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Councillor Campbell, same question. Uh, first, thank you, Liz, and thank you, of course, to the BSA. Um, yes, we've done a lot of Zoom forums, but I had a challenge getting on this one. So happy to be <laughs> here with everyone. Um, I, I opposed uh, the Municipal Harbor Plan and came out publicly uh, testifying before the state uh, some, some weeks ago. And this was grounded in what I heard from not just residents, but stakeholders, including some of our cultural institutions like the aquarium and others along the waterfront. Um, so this has been a decision I have, have been pushing. I do think residents have been frustrated for now, I think almost a decade, um, saying that that plan does not reflect the viewpoints of the stakeholders and residents. Um, this is the time now to go back to the drawing table to put the power and authority around the development of a new plan into the hands of our cultural institutions and our residents so that we're building a waterfront that is not only resilient, but inclusive, accessible, particularly to other communities like Mattapan where I live. And I think there's a desire to do just that. The city must take the lead and I'm excited for the possibilities. Thank you. Councillor Wu, same question. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for convening us. I'm, I'm so excited to dive in. I hope we get to talk about the architecture of City Hall at some point today during this <laughs> conversation as well. It's certainly a topic. Um, I am really grateful for the efforts of the BSA and the partnership that we've had and working together on the council and thinking about zoning board reform and, and all and many other matters. Um, on this one in particular, I would start by saying we shouldn't have been in this place to begin with. Predictability is so important for the development process, for community planning, and the fact that we are even having this conversation and this question, responding to this question, is because our system and process is broken. Uh, there was a long period of time, there were lots of comments and it got to the point where even the court had to step in and say that this was something that needed to be fixed. And so, you know, unfortunate as it is because we do see, see harmful impacts when plans and, and numbers that are at least planned on are suddenly pulled out, uh, but this was a solution to um, something that shouldn't have gotten here to begin with. The waterfront is such a treasure for Boston. And in the places where we've gotten it right, it is breathtaking to see the harbor, to feel that connection. We need to have a plan that truly takes into account how important this part is for the residences, for resiliency, for tourism and economic activity. We have the chance to get it right here. So Councilor Wu, I'm gonna ask you and everyone else a follow-up. And this is an audience question. Do you think that given climate change, Boston should really stop developing on the floodplain or should they keep developing? So it's, it's um, 
even interesting that the question is asked that way because we have been having internal conversations about which definition of the floodplain we are even using. Every time we go back to the numbers, the projections are worse. They are now the, the previous worst case scenarios are now the best case scenarios. And so we need to be thinking much more into the future than even just what the, the current maps are that define uh, flood risk insurance and all of that. We need to have a baseline where Boston is thinking about the immediate impacts and mitigation for especially residences who can't afford the type of uh, flood proofing and, and climate resiliency measures that some of our larger commercial buildings have been able to um, achieve. But we also need to move away from a one-off negotiation with each building. A voluntary resiliency checklist administered by the BPDA simply doesn't have enough teeth and isn't a high enough standard. And so I agree that we need to be taking aggressive action at this point. The IPCC's report shows that even if we did everything we can, it's 20 years until temperatures will stabilize. So we need to start doing everything we can right now and lead the way through our development process. Okay, Councillor Campbell, the same question for you, should Boston keep developing in the floodplain? And as Councillor Wu points out, there are different definitions of where that lies, but uh, how do you feel about that? Yes, there are different definitions and, and all of us have been on a series of forums and Zoom meetings for on these issues for a long time, but also as candidates for mayor. And the short answer is, I think, no, obviously long-term it's a mistake. I think when we're having conversations specifically around the seaport, for example, or the Four Point Channel, what I have heard from residents, stakeholders, the Children's Museum, I did a Zoom meeting with them, um, is major concerns around development that may end up underwater. Um, the, the other angle though that I think is more important that I also, not more important, just as important that I bring to this is looking at other parts of the city that are also situated near water. I live near Mattapan, for example, we talk about the river, we talk about flooding on Morrissey Boulevard, we talk about a whole host of uh, issues where these communities are also facing concerns around flooding and not necessarily seeing the response or the action that is responsive uh, to creating development that is resilient in these neighborhoods. So it has to be a citywide plan. It has to be informed by residents and stakeholders before we proceed. Okay, John Barrow, same question for you. Uh, thanks, Liz. You know, uh, Boston's done an amazing job as a waterfront city, both in expanding and thinking about technology and, and, and helping to improve our design for new buildings. We can, in fact, continue to, to build and you know, the flood, the floodplains, you know, any way you cut it, it's a large part of our city, right? That is, uh, so we, we, we have a lot already built. Um, we, we can continue to design and improve our technology and innovation and continue to build while protecting people, while protecting our neighborhoods. In fact, I think uh, as we continue to build, it'll give us the opportunity to build economic value to protect our neighborhoods, to, bring, to build the flood barriers that we need, to build the kind of seawalls that we need to build in different places to elevate uh, different parts of our neighborhoods, to elevate different roads. Those are the kinds of things that Boston needs to do as we become a more, uh, uh, you know, sort of zero, zero carbon emission city that we're more resilient because climate change is here. Ch climate change is here. And so as we build, let's use all of the technology and invest in all of the protections we can. So uh, the next question, Councilor Wu, you touched on this a bit. I'm going to start with you, Councilor Campbell. Boston's development is particularly hodgepodge, many would say inequitable, because of the lack of a comprehensive updated zoning plan. There's former Mayor Walsh's Imagine Boston 2030 initiative, which is a general roadmap without mandates. Should a comprehensive zoning plan, one that accounts for community input, be made? There's a lot of programs in Boston, a lot of goals but doesn't it all start with zoning? Wouldn't that mean that planning for a neighborhood growth would be set before the developer arrives? Yes, zoning, planning, we have to go back to the drawing board. I'm a district counselor and I always stress that point. I have been involved in every single development project in my district. And it's a distinction between the at-large candidates and other candidates in the race, because what I think district counselors have expressed over 
the years is just that, this ad hoc response to development. I have Dorchester, Mattapan, JP, and Rosendale. Residents are beyond frustrated that when there's a proposal for, a, say, a, a dense transit-oriented development, there's no conversation around economic development or green space, other things that community may need. So I have been saying, let's go back to the drawing board, not just for planning for the sake of planning. The 2030 plan is a great start, but we need to add more meat on the bones. What does every neighborhood need? And we know the beautiful thing about the city of Boston is that we take pride in our neighborhoods and the uniqueness of them. We say we need affordable housing. Great, Mattapan, what type of housing? What are the current demographics? What are the demographics to come? West Roxbury needs different type of housing. Charlestown, East Sea, the same thing. What else do our communities need? They need to be prepared for climate. They need infrastructure changes, transportation, speed humps in certain neighborhoods, economic development, parks, green space. And so once we have a sense of what that is for every neighborhood, codify that into our zoning code and then make sure that we are building in response to that so that we have a predictable, consistent process that doesn't just work, of course, for residents, but works for developers and builders too. And once we have that, people who are coming to the city of Boston with plans, we of course can hold them accountable to what our plan is. And so I'm excited about what the future can hold as well. I have to add one more piece. I don't know what the time is. Very quickly, very quickly. Everything that we do though, it has to be of course in response to issues of climate, but ensuring that we are also being inclusive and making our city more accessible across every neighborhood. And that may mean that we have to make some difficult choices around some particular neighborhood uh, request. Okay, so John Barros, is it time to go back to the drawing board on the zoning plan? Oh, it, it is. In fact, uh, as part of the Walsh administration, I was uh, honored to co-chair Imagine Boston 2030, which gave us a really high level framework for us to be able to do neighborhood based plans, neighborhood based master plans. We need to do uh, planning at a neighborhood level so that we can uh, up, update our zones so we can, in fact, rezone the entire city. You are absolutely right. We need to make sure that the neighborhood is planning before we develop. Now, obviously, we need to continue to respond to development applications. So we need to hurry up and do planning. I've called for, um, well, first, let me just say this. I spent most of my professional career as, uh, 13 years uh, as the head of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative doing neighborhood planning, working with the city, in fact, doing master planning, and then having that agreed as how we would uh, grow our city, grow our neighborhood, grow our neighborhood without displacement. There is a way to do this, which is why as I came out of the uh, being chair of uh, Imagine Boston 2030. I led the Upham Scorner pilot to show, in fact, that we can work with neighborhoods to acquire land and build neighborhoods according to the community's plan. The city should be an active part of that process. Okay, uh, Councillor Wu, I have a slightly different version of this question. You have frequently called for updated zoning. You want to abolish the BPDA itself but Boston doesn't have full control over its land use, which obviously raises obstacles for getting things done. For example, in response to the bribery scandal in the ZBA two years ago, the city council, you included, passed a home rule petition with the Zoning Board of Appeal reforms, but the state house still hasn't acted. So how do you actually accomplish what you're calling for? Yeah, I appreciate this question. I was going to dive into my diatribe about <laughs> that is encapsulated in the 70 page report. The bottom line is that we have one of the most complex, arbitrary and therefore costly development approvals processes anywhere. And that is drawing the resources that should be going from development to closing our gaps and addressing resiliency and investing in transportation infrastructure and affordability. It is drawing those resources instead to managing the process itself, the soft costs of attorneys and consultants and uh, the unpredictability of where we'll, we will end up. We need not only to have a process where community members can help set the rules for how our neighborhoods grow, but how the growth of each neighborhood fits in with the entire city. And so we are not thinking about arbitrary rules here or there, that sense of equity, equity and making sure that we are meet, meeting our shared future. And so the report that I put out uh, is, is addresses this exactly this question exactly because we have seen frankly every mayoral candidate since the creation of the BRA commit to unwinding this agency and putting forward a more thoughtful and community-based process including the last couple of mayors uh, what what happens is the state is very much involved but what we need to do is ensure that every possible step we take at the local level funding 
laws, zoning reform, um, and, and personnel to make sure that we can do, uh, we can get to 75, 80% of that. And then once we have an updated zoning code, that truly will govern how we have predictability and uh, resources available to close the gaps in the city. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wu. And I'm sorry to have to keep uh, hustling you all along. We wanna cover a lot of ground. John Barrows, this is another audience question. If you're involving communities more in the development process, how do you balance the need to create more affordable housing with the inevitable pushback against development? And so for example, things like parking requirement reductions. Yeah, no, Liz, that's a great question. Uh, as uh, In my time doing community-based planning through the Dalisha Neighborhood Initiative, it was clear to me that if in fact we're gonna do community-led planning and then we're gonna be able to implement those plans that the city has to be a partner in development. The city has to subsidize more. The city has to create more efficiencies in our process. We need to make sure that the community's vision is not put on the laps of private development. There is a huge cost gap usually between what the community wants to see in terms of green space, um, affordability, levels of affordability, different uses, and what the private sector can pay for. That's why I, I championed the process in Upham Scorner to purchase some land. And I would do that as mayor. We would purchase land in different neighborhoods to work with the neighbors to remove the cost of land. We would make sure that we were uh, putting in other subsidies to make sure that we had deeper affordability, deeper subsidies. We can't continue to pit community against uh, private development. It doesn't work. That's why I think the BPDA is an important tool that we use eminent domain, that we use 121A agreement, the pilot agreement to create conditions for us to meet the community's standards. If we, dis if we dismantle the BPDA, that would never happen. Not sure uh, when that was heard, but I know Mayor Walsh and Mayor Manino never promised to dismantle the BPDA. It would be uh, reckless to do that. We need the tools of the BPDA to hold on to some of the land covenant agreements that we have now, protect some of the community benefits and continue to use its tools, to, in fact, meet the community's plans. Okay, Councillor Wood, do you wanna to respond to that? I'll just say that um, it has been a frequent conversation and commitment to make sure that we have true planning that is accountable to our residents. And when they are jammed in the same mega agency, again, a structure unlike any other major cities development approvals process, planning gets subsumed by development. And so we really need to deeply reform that process while ensuring we have stability in the development pipeline. And I put forward a plan to make sure that we can do all of those pieces. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Campbell? Which question am I answering with this? <laughs> this question is about how are you going to balance the community needs and mm. getting more affordable housing? Inevitably you get pushback uh, against development um, and communities will resist uh, certain requirements. Well, I will say I've been on the council for six years and Dorchester, Mattapan are my biggest neighborhoods. Those are the communities that actually need more development because they have been for generations under-resourced, under-invested in. They need structural changes, expansion of transportation. Uh, they need not only affordable housing, economic development, so much. And what I've found is it's rare that you get residents who are unreasonable. There, Yes, there are some who say, I don't want any development whatsoever. But the majority of residents do want development. They want it, of course, to be they want to be a part of the process. They want to inform what's coming into their community, rightfully so. They also want to have a seat at the table when planning what's going to happen in their communities. And they don't want an ad hoc response. I've been stressing that this system that we currently have isn't just failing residents because of the lack of predictability and consistency. It's failing developers, builders, architects, everybody. And so there is a way in which to go back to the table to do that planning that we talked about earlier, to of course codify it in our zoning code so that when we're going back out to build say transit oriented development or affordable housing, that we make it easier to do so. Um, I've even proposed removing affordable housing from the article 80 process to bring that online quicker. And so I do think once we do this, it will be more predictable. Residents will feel like their voice is being heard and then we can hold everyone accountable to building uh, what we wanna see and what residents wanna see in their communities. Okay, thank you. And now I wanna welcome in Councillor Asaibi George, uh, which means we have more candidates now, which is fabulous, but it means this is even going to feel a little bit more like the lightning round of Jeopardy. So we got to pep it along. Um, 
uh, Councillor Asabi George, uh, this is an audience question. How would you move to increase the percentage of affordable housing, or would you move to increase the percentage of affordable housing in required and new developments? Well, I'm grateful to be with all of you this afternoon, and I apologize for coming in late. I'd also love to answer that last question because I think uh, process and planning and community are really important components when we think about building our city and continuing to build our city. And predictability is so incredibly important for both builder and resident and knowing what the zoning code is and should be. I think we have to go through a significant master planning process across our city and work, walk away from or work our way away from um, this, you know, the, the ZBA hearings with variance after variance after variance. There has to be greater predictability in the system for sure. And okay. we have to work towards creating more affordable housing in our city. And we have to look for opportunities to increase the percentage of affordable housing. You know, Councilor Campbell mentioned the work that we're doing on the city council to speed up the process for 100% affordable projects in our city. We need to commit to that as a city and I'm committed to doing that as mayor and look for ways to increase that percentage as well. Okay, John, John Barrows, would you move to increase that percentage of affordable housing required in new developments? Yeah, I mean, affordable housing is critical, boss, and continues to be too expensive for too many of our families. And we know that housing stability, quality housing, is at the foundation of, of good health outcomes and, and addressing the health disparities. It's also at the foundation of, of academic outcomes and making sure that people are doing well in school. So it's so critical that we invest all we can in housing. That includes working with the private sector to in increase the amount of affordable housing in our development. That's why as Chief of Economic Development, I led the process working with the development community to increase the linkage fees. We made a 42% increase in linkage fees, both uh, investing in affordable housing and in workforce development, two things that are fundamental to how Boston continues to grow. Uh, Andrea Campbell, would you increase the percentage of affordable housing required in new developments? Yes, I would. And, and I speak to this in my, my housing plan. And actually, I'm really proud of my housing plan because I engage not only residents, advocates, um, but builders, architects, including this very community. I also talk a lot about, though, in addition to doing that, we need to be cutting the red tape and bureaucracy and not just within the BPDA's process. So I propose removing affordable housing from Article 80, um, but ISD. ISD also plays a critical role and it's often seen or deemed to be a barrier uh, to inspections and just how long it takes. We need more staff there. We also need to make sure that that department too is incorporated uh, to anything and everything we do with respect to building affordable housing. Okay, we're gonna mix it up a little as we go through this. I have the chance to answer that question. Oh no, you're right, you're right. <laughs> Councillor Wu, we're not gonna mix it up that much and cut you out, go ahead. I'll go lightning style. Um, I, I just want to emphasize, as has been said by, by my colleagues already, that this is one tool in many, many tools that need to be deployed all at once. We are in the midst of a housing crisis and a displacement crisis. We see it. The census data was a clear call to action as we see a city that is growing, but a city where there are fewer Black Bostonians who live in Boston today than 10 years ago. Families families of color, black and brown Bostonians are getting pushed out of the city because of the way that our development approvals process exacerbates housing and affordability and, and slows the process of building more housing down. Um, and so we need to not think of anything as a silver bullet, but to ensure that we are leaning into the city's city level of government, taking responsibility for what we can do. Use public dollars to build more affordable housing, integrating that with city owned property and buildings, ease our zoning code and streamline so that, that the private market can move faster. Ensure that we are um, leveraging every bit of federal funds for housing stability and boosting home ownership and it, making sure that um, we are not leaning on IDP, the inclusionary development program or any of our um, linkage requirements as the only way that we are boosting affordable housing. This is much more about ensuring we have integrated neighborhoods uh, while doing everything we can to boost supply and stabilize our residents. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Wu. I, I do appreciate your reply. Um, now we're gonna turn to a question from a candidate to the candidates. This is a question from Andrea Campbell for her fellow candidates. This is for all the candidates. Um, I'm gonna start with you, John Barrows. Do you have any rental properties or personal financial stake in real estate or development? And if so, what do you say to voters who are worried about City Hall putting profits over people? Andrea, thank you for that question. Um, the I do have rental property. Uh, as you know, um, I uh, have rental units. And so what I say is I also own a small business. And so I am uh, accustomed to making sure that I disclose all of my financial interests every year. Uh, as, a, as a city official, I've been doing it for seven years. And so it's been very clear what I own. I also make sure that if there's any uh, resources that can go to a rental unit or any resources that can go to uh, my, my small business, my, my restaurant, that my business never sees it. Uh, I've done that even as I've supported small businesses in Boston. I've made sure that my small restaurant received none of the resources during the pandemic, none of the resources before the pandemic. Even as we were hurting, we tried to figure out other ways to do it. As mayor, I will continue to be transparent in what I own. I will continue to make sure that I avoid conflicts of interest uh, by making sure that we get no resources from the city, that I get no resources from the city or no approval in the process that somebody else wouldn't be entitled to. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wu, same question. Um, I own a two family home in Roslindale. I live upstairs with my husband and two boys. My mom lives downstairs, um, as has been played out in the media a little bit. Uh, there's one interpretation, which I don't quite agree with, of the city's rental registration ordinance that has suggested that I should register my mom's unit, for which we have no lease. There's no payments. It's effectively one household, but out of respect for our city workers, um, I did register it. It was the first time that I received a letter that I was out of compliance with this in all the years that I have lived here. It came addressed to me a few months before an election, which was uh, interesting all on its own. Um, but I, this, this is the property that I own with my husband that I am sitting in right now. Okay, uh, Councillor Asaibi George, same question for you. It's a, uh, a fantastic question and certainly one that I'm fascinated in. As many of you know, I do own rental property with my husband and it is property that we disclose as required through our work, our employment, our responsibility as elected officials here in the city of Boston, my capacity as a city councilor. Certainly as mayor, um, my husband who owns his own business will not be able to do business before the boards I appoint. And that is certainly a, a commitment I have to the people of Boston, certainly a responsibility I have in my capacity and my role as mayor of this city. And through um, some, some efforts that we're going through right now, looking to see how we uh, engage with uh, council um, through the ethics commission on making sure that there is very clear uh, instruction and understanding if my husband were to do some work on a home, how he would pull that permit and things like that. But presenting himself before boards and commissions uh, would be a no-no for us and, and certainly something that we're committed to. Okay, and a further question on that point. It's been, it's been pointed out that your, your husband, a developer, he has existing properties in the city. How can you assure that with anything from inspections to taxes, that city employees won't feel compelled to give him special treatment. So as I mentioned in uh, my remarks just now, we have consulted with council and we'll be hiring an ethics attorney, uh, perhaps someone to operate as an abuds person uh, through any of those proceedings. Councillor Campbell, your question to you. No, uh, I, and, and, and the reason it came up is because after that Globe article, as you can imagine, we all got questions and I did as well. And I hadn't really noticed it before, but my husband and I both do not have personal a personal financial interest in any work of developers or real estate. Um, and I do think in this moment in time where we're talking about transparency, accountability, housing affordability is a question that comes for voters. Um, there's also... Uh, 
something you mentioned earlier around corruption and the BPDA that lingers with residents and constituents. It's the very reason I filed a legislation creating an Office of Inspector General, which I would continue to push for as a proactive tool in our toolkit to ensure there is no conflict of interest within city government. Um, and so it's a question that comes up frequently, but the short answer for me is no. Okay. This is a question from candidate John Barros, and I am going to ask you this one, Councilor Wu. Uh, John asks, I know this is a room full of architects. I know some people in our neighborhoods have complained a bit about a lack of creativity and design in some of our new housing, as well as a tendency to be a bit timid with our downtown skyscrapers. What would you do to encourage bolder thinking and what could you do to offset the higher cost of more creative architecture? <laughs> so John and I are in the same way. Like my question kind of comes at the same idea from a different angle. And it is true, we are just such a city of enormous talent and creativity and resources. And because of the way that our development process is quite um, stunted sometimes and, and myopic, we end up setting up a system where the, the victory, right, is just making it to the end of that process, not arriving at an inspirational, um, remarkable, piece of art and architecture along with the functional building. And so I think there's a, a good deal of that is how we think about planning in the city, how we set up mechanisms to be specific and intentional about the interactions between ground floor and the streetscape and thinking about details where we have artists and the arts and culture community's perspective directly represented in planning. So part, you know, I'm, I'm really excited. We have lots of policy plans up on our website. I encourage people to check them out but I'm proud that they're all intersectional as well. And so in our arts plan, we talk about installing full-time artists to help with community outreach and facilitate conversations. And then on the planning side to ensure that we are really thinking about design in a very intentional way. Okay, uh, this is an audience question. Uh, and this is for John Barros. How will your administration improve access to opportunities for builders, designers, and construction managers of color? Thanks, Liz. Uh, incredibly important question. Uh, I am inc incredibly proud of the work I did to complete a very strong disparity study for the city of Boston. We now have the tool to make sure, in fact, that we have goals in any project that is getting any kind of city relief. Uh, in fact, before I left office, the mayor signed an executive order that 25 percent of the city spend will be spent, uh, discretionary spend will, of contracts will be spent on women owned and people of color owned businesses. That's $180 million going to businesses in our neighborhoods, going to families in our neighborhoods that typically don't see them. It is incredibly important that as mayor, that I use that same tool to make sure that construction contracts have goals. This is something that I've been um, you know, dying to do as chief of economic development, just finished the tool to do it and looking forward to doing it as mayor. Okay, same question for you, Councillor Asaibi George. I think it's really important that we are supporting locally owned businesses here in the city of Boston, that we are very intentional in outreach to black owned, brown owned, woman owned businesses, especially those that exist here in our city and make it easier for them to interface with, with city government to do business both with the city and in the city. We have an opportunity through our Office of Economic Development or whatever the, the new name will be under our administration to really be very much focused on that, building that. I am a small business owner myself here in the city of Boston, and it is sometimes too difficult to do business in this city. And I've heard that time and time again from restaurateurs to retailers to those that own just office space and, and sort of backspace. We need to make sure that both our main streets and our side streets and those that are doing business with and in the city of Boston have greater ease of being able to, to interface with, with us as a city. And we've got to spend the dollars here in the city of Boston. Thank you. This is a question from candidate Asaibi George. This is a question for uh, Councillor Campbell. What factors will you take into consideration when planning for the future of Boston's neighborhoods and addressing citywide growth? What factors? Uh, many, I think it goes back to the planning conversation we had earlier. And that while the 2030 plan is a great start, there needs to be more meat on the bones. We need to be looking at, of course, the demographics of every neighborhood. 
the number of children, for example, families, to decide not only what type of affordable housing, what type of school infrastructure do we need? There are certain neighborhoods that have been screaming for elementary schools and middle schools. What type of structural changes do we need to our streets? What type of transportation infrastructure do we need? Uh, what type of economic activity? Some communities don't have access to parks and green space, um, which is ridi ridiculous when you think we are a coastal city uh, facing major climate issues. Um, some communities, of course, also want um, to be more connected and, and connected to other parts of the city to feel more, um, I, I'll just share a quick story. I have a senior building, Codman Square building in my, my uh, district in Dorchester. I had a resident one time remark, I wanna go to that new neighborhood. I didn't know what she was talking about. She was talking about the seaport and it felt so far away. So how do we of course ensure that as we're building and planning that every neighborhood feels connected, we create space for artists, for artists. We create space using art, art, art culture and restaurants to help us connect across neighborhoods. Thank you, thank you. Here's an audience question uh, from Ray Porfilio. Uh, and this is a question for Councillor Wu. And in fact, I may move on through a few of you for this question. 4% of buildings, those are the large buildings and institutions account for more than 50% of Boston's carbon footprint. Will the green building rules being considered by the city council known as Birdo 2.0, building energy reporting and disclosure ordinance, say that three times fast, 2.0, get us on track to meet our climate goals? Do you support it? And if not, what's needed to get us to our goals? Thank you for this question, Ray, and for your advocacy and that of your household, a very, very engaged constituents leading the charge as Boston should be. I fully support this uh, update to Birdo and want to shout out Councilor Matt O'Malley as uh, pushing this forward and serving as the chair of our, our Committee on Environment and Sustainability for, for a very long time on the council. We know that the vast majority of emissions in Boston's carbon footprint come from buildings and that the largest buildings account for the most, uh, the, the large, uh, disproportionate share. And so we need to be taking every possible step as I'd mentioned before, this is an urgent issue where the impacts are here today. They are exacerbating disparities across the city. And so I not only support this, but have been proud to put forward the first city level Green New Deal anywhere in the country that comprehensively lays out the policies at the municipal level that we can continue to layer on top of that to accelerate decarbonization, ensure that we are leaning into green jobs and the new economy and bring about the healthiest, most prosperous future for all of our communities. Thank you. Uh, John Barrow, same question for you on Birdo 2.0. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely support Birdo 2.0 and the inclusion of, of better policies for those buildings that are releasing more carbon into our, uh, into our, into our um, atmosphere. It is clear that I think the work that we did to, in, to uh, create the Renew Boston Trust uh, that allows the city of Boston to work with large property owners to retrofit those buildings can be used here. We need to mandate certain retrofits for those large buildings and we can work with them given the kind of utility spend that they make to use the savings from the efficiencies to finance it. As, as mayor, in fact, I will help finance it by looking at the, the, the savings we can have from the retrofits provide the capital up front and work with some of the larger buildings that might need it. Now they might not need it, but I think we need to mandate and make sure that we can move to address uh, the carbon emissions and, and, and make them more resilient. And then I will ask them to be anchors for microgrids in their areas. We need to make sure that Boston's neighborhoods are, are more efficient and some of them uh, are situated next to some of our more vulnerable neighborhoods. It is critical that we work with them to shore the neighborhoods up as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Asaibi George, same question, Birdo 2.0. Well, we know that we're in a climate emergency and can't wait any longer to develop new plans. Certainly appreciate and support the efforts of Council O'Malley on uh, Birdo 2.0 and engaging in our working sessions and the conversations around that effort. We know that Boston already has a roadmap <coughs> for carbon neutral by 2050 and we need swift action and push to implement those plans pretty quickly. We also have an opportunity here in the city of Boston to 
not just work to increase energy efficiency in buildings across our city, um, it, it, private sector buildings, that we are making sure that we're implementing these changes, these plans, these efforts in our city owned buildings, especially in our schools. As I, as, as mayor, as a city councilor, I've advocated and worked towards this. As mayor, we will certainly not just double down, but triple down our efforts to invest in our school facilities. When we think about rebuilding the Boston Public Schools, we have an opportunity to lead right there. And it's about the immediate steps, the immediate actions in the near future, as well as planning for the longer term. Although we don't, we don't have a great deal of time to think long term, it's work that has to happen today. So uh, candidates, we are at about 1.55. I think some of you had to leave early. We'd like to go to 2.05, maybe just a tad longer. Can you all confirm that you can stay? Okay, all right, we're gonna keep going. So then that same question, Birdo 2.0 for uh, Councillor Campbell. Yes, and, and I wanna applaud Council O'Malley as well, obviously our current council president for his leadership over the years. Uh, on these on these critical issues, I know that there is, I think, a third working session coming up um, to work out uh, any type of tweaks that need to be made based on um, some responses that he's received from, I think, even some folks on this Zoom, the real estate board, a whole host of stakeholders, and I'm confident we'll get that done. And I want to thank him for creating an inclusive process taking the conversation into community. Uh, Ray, thank you as well for the question, but it's necessary work if we wanna, of course, be prepared and ready to respond to issues of climate. Okay, and back to a question from a candidate. This is from Councillor Wu, uh, and we'll start with Councillor Saibi George. What is your favorite example of impactful architecture or design in Boston? And what is the city's role in facilitating thoughtful and inclusive design? <clears throat> Thank you for the question. And I came in late in this lunch, so I snuck off camera just to have a bite of a sandwich. You know, when I think about, and the question that was asked earlier too around design and building the city, we have to certainly make sure that we are always complementing the local aesthetic and, and really making sure that new design, new architecture doesn't mimic it, but complement it and also take opportunities to be edgy. As a student at Boston Technical High School, which is now the O'Brien School here in the city of Boston, I actually studied drafting and architecture and, and thought for a quick moment that it, it may be something I'd like to do as an adult. I, I choose to be the architect um, in chief of this city and, and seeking support to be mayor of this city. But I think it's really important that we are in, engaging and encouraging uh, creative thinking, thoughtful thinking, uh, and innovation when we think about the design of this city, both at the downtown and in the neighborhoods. And that it is the architects and community that are thinking and shaping that together. Too often, unqualified individuals are remarking about material use, glass use, um, what uh, dimensions and, and where the front of a building is versus the, the rear of a building. We have to do those with the professionals at the table, those that have dedicated their life to design, but certainly always remembering that how we build our city, how we design our city has to complement our city. Councillor Campbell, the same question. I'm just thinking about what is a beautiful space I like to begin. <laughs> and I, or I any can't... impactful architecture, something you think, um, uh, is really wonderful design. And also, you know, what, what is the city's role in facilitating mm -hmm. that? Well, I, I, because we were just talking about Morrissey Boulevard flooding, I was just having a conversation about UMass. I know it seems very random, but I guess in this conversation, the, the, the buildings, of course, whether it's the, just the complex over there, the EMK Institute, UMass, the U, new UMass um, Boston campus that looks out to the water, is just stunning. And I often hear from residents who are invited into that space for different community events and, and particularly our youth, many have never seen the water, right? So this, it's open, it's accessible, it's light, um, it lets light in, it's inviting. Um, and then of course, it's surrounded by other buildings that are serving a unique purpose, but when you bring them together, serve a larger purpose around civic engagement, for example. Um, and so that at the, 
off the top of my head is, is what I think about. And I do think the city has an incredible role to play so that we are not getting buildings, and I'll just be frank, that are ugly, that we are not getting buildings that are using materials, frankly, um, where you almost have to redesign and rebuild the building in the next five or 10 years because it's it's um, cheaply made. And I hear that a lot in the context of affordable housing opportunities as well in the city. So we have a lot more work to do. And obviously this organization can play a critical role working with the city on all of those issues. Okay, well, Councillor Campbell, hold that thought on what's ugly because I'm going to get back to that. John Barrows, uh, the same question. Uh, what's an example of impactful architecture or design in Boston? Uh, great question. I, I have to say I am a big fan of the Museum of National Center of Afro-American Artists right here in Roxbury and the head in front of that building, just, it came to mind immediately when you asked that question. But I think the recent design that's powerful um, and that sends a message in Boston, and I'm gonna butcher the name of the building, but it's, uh, I think it's Science and Data Center at BU. It is a great design. It's that stack design kind of feels like books that are being stacked. Um, and then the, the climate resilience uh, features for that building are just tremendous. So it's both architecturally, uh, you know, saying something about a college campus, but then it is modeling the kind of design that we need to have to make sure that Boston is a, is a climate ready, climate resilient city. But John, does the city have a role in facilitating that kind of architecture? Yes, it does. I think the city has a role, both from a leadership standpoint, asking for bold design that sends the right signals around our values. You know, and that's why I went immediately to, to Roxbury and, and what the museum stands for us here, but then to BU in terms of what the, the data science center stands for the future of the city, both in terms of education and in, in terms of climate resilience. I think we have to ask as, as the, uh, the mayor has to ask as the leader of the city for us to put our values on our sleeves and lead with design. It is critical. And then the, we need to be partners in helping that happen, either through the, the planning process or helping to find ways to, to, to help capitalize more of those statements. Okay, well, you've all proven to be champions at this uh, Jeopardy version of a uh, mayoral panel. I'm not gonna weigh in on your chances for, of your candidacy, but I can tell you, you'd all be winners at Jeopardy. So that brings me to the last question, which is really gonna be like the lightning round. Um, the first question for all of you from the BSA that was posted on their website was name a place in the city where everyone feels comfortable and tell us why that works. So my question now is what is your least favorite place? What is a place that just doesn't work, a place that's really ugly and you want to change? So that's your question. You have a few seconds to think about it and we're gonna come back to your answers uh, after closing words from Greg Minot, the president of the Boston Society for Architecture. Greg. And uh, thank you, Liz. And thank you to what has been an amazing discussion. And thank you to all of the candidates for their candor and their time today. Um, we really appreciated um, all of the questions um, and those from the audience. And thank you all for participating. Um, you know, again, we just want to reiterate uh, BSA and their role in the city, uh, supporting the members. And also that we're passionate about um, design, a lot of the things that you've mentioned, and we are here um, in partnership. And we offer that partnership to um, all of you and we wish all of you the best in your candidacy. Um, if there's any final, I don't think there's any other questions. Um, I think we're winding down at this point, but I want to thank you all for your time today and uh, we look forward to um, what's coming next for you all. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Greg. Okay, it's on to the last question. Uh, I'll start with you, Councillor Sai B. George, and if you can just give me, this is the lightning round, your 30-second answer. You had said one of your favorite places was the Rose Kennedy Greenway. So what is it that you really dislike? Really ugly, you got to change it. 
So I can't think of a place in the city that I dislike. I think that it's important that everyone is able to experience the places across our city. And if their experience isn't good, that's what we need to change. Um, you know, we've got a beautiful city with great things happening here. And every inch of it to me is beautiful. It is about the experience um, that sometimes our residents are unable to have in, in places that we Thank need. you. Thank you. Michelle Wu, you love Franklin Park. Is there a building that you really want to change or something that really gets under your skin? Yeah, okay. I'm going to go real, real quick. I have a couple. Um, first, as I've been saying, I will fight anyone who doesn't like City Hall, protect it, make it energy efficient, open it up. Uh, but one pet peeve is the plaza and the sort of sheer brick walls that really close people off from the streetscape, uh, a low hanging fruit for us to fix. Um, Widette Circle is another area where you can just see the potential for the city to do something remarkable and transformational, currently a, a leaky, a flooding tow lot and um, some, some parking lots. And then in, in, in the seaport, again, just my heart hurts when I'm there because I see what we missed out on having had the chance to do and so many of the sort of public spaces that you can't tell are public are, wall, are walled off from the water. Um, we, we could have gone a lot better there and we had the chance to really get it right along the harbor in other ways now. Okay, thank you, Councillor Wu. John Barros, you love the libraries. What do you dislike, a building, a place? What do you wanna change? Yeah, love the libraries. Um, I'll go with uh, uh, Campbell on UMass Boston. The library there is amazing. The waterfront there is amazing. Um, the place that I want to change, Liz, is, is Mass and Cass. Um, when I just went, I went to my, my sort of like places I'm going in Boston today and not feeling good about, it's Mass and Cass, it's the people, it's the trash, it's the human feces on the floor. That's all about how we use place. And right now that is saying something really bad about us as a city. It is saying something really bad about us taking care of those who are most vulnerable. And that's the place day one as mayor that I will hit the streets on because I'm there today to make sure that we change. Okay, thank you, John. And that is a question I would have loved to have asked you if you would all be willing to come back for a round two, we could get to that, but it's a, it's a very huge question. Uh, Andrea Campbell, you love the Neponset River Greenway. What would you change? What do you dislike? Yes, I love the Greenway. I live in Mattapan, and so we have to keep connecting it to every neighborhood. Um, but I'm on the record calling City Hall a hot mess, um, and so a lot more to do with City Hall to be more inviting to our residents and to make sure that the city employees that work so hard are also able to connect in that space. Um, and so a lot more to do there. And then I just have to just echo what John said. You know, I grew up on Mass Ave. It is painful and tragic what is unfolding. And I appreciate him lifting it up because it is the, the public health crisis that needs immediate attention long before this uh, next election. And so we'll keep fighting uh, in partnership with, with everyone on, on here to have an impact in that area. So thank you. And thank you, Liz. And thank you, Greg. And thank you, Jenny, and everyone for having me. And thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Thank all of you for your patience with this lightning pace. Um, you all deserve a prize. I know which one you want. I can't give that to you, but some kind of prize should be given because you were, you were great sports in all this. I thank you very much. Thanks to the BSA and to the audience. That's it. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.